My name is Rita Boncompagni Ludovisi. Um, I was married to the late Niccolo Boncompagni Ludovisi, 12th Prince of Piombino, and uh, he was the head of the family. And this is, was our home, or is our home, and uh, I've lived here for uh, almost 20 years. This building was built in 1570. The first owner was Cardinal Francesco da Monte. And when you come into the Ingresso, you will see the ceiling was done by the leading Mannerist painter in 1570, Zuccheri. And although it celebrates the, um, the good works of Cardinal Francesco Nero, uh, as you go around it, and in the center, uh, there is a um, face of the grotesque. And as you, you turn, as you're looking at it, and the face follows you everywhere it goes, and the eyes change color. They go from brown to blue. Um, and then there's a baldacchino in the ingresso. Only families that descend from popes have the baldacchinos. So it's full of history. It's about 30,000 square feet, but it's two acres of land in the middle of Rome. You're in the landscape room, which was featured at the Grand Palais in Paris and also at the Prada Museum in Madrid in 2010. There's a fresco by Guccino, Brio, Viola, Domenichino, the center Pomerancho, and they said that this is the finest representation of 17th century landscape art in the world. The home and the property is what's left of what was once more than an 85-acre garden in the center of Rome. It was the biggest garden of its kind in Rome. The property was later redeveloped into separate plots along what today is Via Veneto, which is one of the most glamorous shopping districts in the world. And the district that's located in is called Ludovisi. It's still named after the princess's husband's family. The home will need more than $10 million worth of renovation. It kind of differs depending on who, who you talk to and what they're kind of threshold of what a livable space is, but even though the princess has done so much renovation work, it still needs additional renovation. Uh, the Michelangelo statue, the reason we know it's Michelangelo, because when uh, Ludovico Ludovisi died very suspiciously in 1633, um, his, his, uh, they did an inventory of everything that he had, and that was one of the inventories. And now he's an expert in statues. Every statue you see at uh, Palazzo Altemps came from here. As I said in the Ingresso, you see the leading Mannerist painter, Zuccheri. Now, 25 or seven years later, Caravaggio did the ceiling in the alchemy room of Cardinal Francesco da Monte. He was an alchemista. He's an alchemist. He, he did his alchemy work there, and he thought he could turn iron into gold, which I'm still searching for. It, but but uh, nonetheless, it was beautiful. It's called Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto, and it's the three elements that uh, Cardinal Francesco da Monte used in his alchemy work. Jupiter, air, Neptune, water, and then Pluto, um, fire, the dogs of Cerebus. And so um, it, it re represents the elements, the Cronus elements that, that uh, Caravaggio used. The Caravaggio ceiling is so important just because Caravaggio was such a, is such an important artist in art history. He's one of the most famous painters in art history and there are less than 90 paintings by Caravaggio known to still exist. It's the only painting that Caravaggio ever painted on a ceiling and it was done when he was in his early 20s and still in very good favor with the Vatican and the wealthy families in Rome. Later he would end up being chased out of Rome because he killed a man in a street fight. In Guccino's painting here um, you'll see uh, the, there's a man lying on the ground and he's turning on a sprinkler system and the women that are on the lower level are getting all wet in their summer frock and the men, their boyfriends, their husbands are all laughing at them and pointing. This is long before all the contests in Florida, you know, and, it was, and they were making fun of all the women getting all wet and uh, so it's such a human um, humanity that came in there uh, with, the, with the people, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. One thing that I think has been repeatedly stressed to me by people I talk to for the story is how much of a turnaround uh, the princess moving into the home was and renovating it was. I mean, the house was just completely written off as ruins and um, before that she moved in, it hadn't been open to the public in years. So thanks to her restoring the house and um, digitizing the archives, hopefully, even if it sells to someone private, um, we still know more about Villa Aurora thanks to her more than we ever would have known. When I was 16, I had just graduated from high school and my parents sent my sister and I who had just graduated from college to Rome with a kind of a teacher uh, to go all over, not just to Rome, but all over Europe. And I felt such an affinity. I can't begin to tell you. I felt like this is something I feel deeply. You can't explain it. And when I went to the uh, Trevi Fountain, 
I threw a coin in and I said, oh, I hope I marry an Italian and live in Rome the rest of my life. Now, little did I know that it would be a prince or that it would take decades, you know, and, and many life transitions, uh, but that's, that's what I wished. And uh, I, my sister and I have never forgotten it. Did dinners and tours and everything I could uh, to support my husband. And I felt, I felt it was important. And also I felt it was such a great honor. I know it's like a drop of sand that uh, my importance uh, in this 500 year old history is negligible or maybe not even seen, but it was for me. And it was such a great honor to restore the 150,000 documents. It was such a great honor to greet people when they came here and tell them about the history and, and everything to try and inspire them themselves in their own lives. And uh, so it's, it's been the greatest honor of my life. And as uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius was feeling is that, you know, this was that one shining golden moment that you know you did something special in your life. And I know that. I think just being with my husband, to be with someone who loved you so much and uh, whom taught me how to love in return, it's a gift that uh, I will never forget. You know, I'd never had that before. I, I never understood what it really meant to be loved and to love in return in such a profound way. You know, it's not easy. It's not easy. My husband gave his life for this house. He did, literally. We never took a vacation. Everybody, all of our friends said, where are you going in August? And we said, no, we're staying here. And they said, but don't you want to go there? I said, no. I said, I'm so happy just being with him. Um, I think that uh, Niccolo gave me the ability to, to really be happy. And I think I'm going to be. I think I'm going to be. My future is going to be good.